Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. I'm Hannah and here we like to talk a lot about sex and relationships and sometimes I feel like my orgasms aren't good enough. So today we're going to be talking about the pressure that we sometimes feel to improve our orgasms. I recently made another video all about what orgasms feel like and how we often set up orgasm as the goal of sex and exploring a lot of the language that we use to describe orgasm. But in this video I wanted to dive a little deeper into how all of this can make us feel like our orgasms aren't good enough. From conversations about simultaneous orgasms, multiple orgasms, orgasms that last for hours and all of these apps and courses out there to help us improve our orgasms, is anyone else feeling like they're supposed to be having totally amazing orgasms all of the time? Just me? It can feel like a lot of pressure and all of that pressure is not very sexy and it can take the fun away from sex in the first place. So why do we feel like we need to improve our orgasms and have more and more of them? And do we really? The orgasm gap. The orgasm gap is the term coined to describe the frequency with which people of different genders and sexualities orgasm. The gap is most distinct between cishet men and cishet women. Boo! A 2017 study in the Archives of Sexual Behaviour actually showed that heterosexual women are the least likely to orgasm during sex. Some of the reasoning behind why the orgasm gap exists includes the lack of education around pleasure for people with vulvas, and women and people of marginalised genders not having the education to understand their own bodies and feel less able to advocate for their own pleasure. There's also the assumption that sex means penis in vagina or PIV penetration, which studies have shown just 18% of women are able to come from alone. As a quick aside here, I'm using the term women because that is what is used in the research. I assume that the data is about cis women because there is not nearly enough data on trans and non-binary people. So the orgasm gap is definitely a feminist issue and yes, we absolutely want women and people of marginalised genders to feel empowered to advocate for their wants and needs in bed. However, all of the discussion about the orgasm gap can make us feel like we have a responsibility as feminists to be doing our bit to close the orgasm gap. We need to advocate for our pleasure. We need to have all of the amazing orgasms. Fight the patriarchy with our mind-blowing orgasms. But all of that can end up feeling like more pressure. Also, orgasm isn't the only way to measure pleasurable and satisfying sex, but it's often the easiest thing for researchers to measure when doing these studies. I actually talked to Becky Lund-Harker all about pleasure research for an episode of my podcast Doing It, which you can listen to if you want to learn more. So we already have the pressure from wanting to be sex positive feminists and close the orgasm gap. But where else does the pressure to improve or upgrade our orgasms come from? Orgasms during partnered sex. If we're already feeling the pressure to have an orgasm, adding another person into the mix isn't always is going to make things easier. Everyone is bringing their own baggage to sexual encounters. It's great when our partners are invested in giving us pleasure and helping us reach orgasm, but sometimes that investment can feel like added pressure. Many people, myself included, have had experiences when it feels like our partner is very set on making us come, but only to show off their own sexual skills, rather than it being about making us feel good. But there's also that space in between where your partner genuinely does want to make you feel good, but even that can make us feel like we need to come because they've spent so much time and effort pleasuring us. And when we feel like we should come, that stress can actually make it harder for us to get off. And our emotions can get quite complicated when it comes to orgasms. It's very normal if you sometimes have moments of jealousy of your partner's orgasms, mixed in with all of the happiness that you made them come or that they experience pleasure. Sometimes you look at your partner when they come and you're like, whoa, that looked like a really good one. And you're super happy for them, but you're also like, oh, I wish I could experience that. All of these feelings are okay and normal. They're just part of navigating the pressure and expectations we feel around sex. So we feel a lot of pressure around being able to orgasm, but what about the pressure in terms of how we orgasm? Are my orgasms good enough? Spoiler alert, yes, your orgasms are good enough. However, many of us have a lot of anxiety around this. It's very common for us to compare our orgasms to other people's or how they're portrayed in mainstream media and porn. We ask questions like, should I be able to orgasm just from nipple stimulation? Or we might feel inferior when we can't have a 20 minute long orgasm when we read that it's possible to train yourself to do that. 
In lots of sex positive spaces, it can feel like everyone is having the most mind blowing, amazing orgasms all of the time, which can make us feel like we're not doing it right if we're not. You're not less sex positive if you're not having loads of orgasms. Sex positivity should be about empowering you to have the sex that you want, including not having sex at all, rather than making you feel sexually inferior. Both mainstream media and porn have a part to play in setting up these ideas that our orgasms aren't good enough. In the absence of comprehensive sex education, we often look to them as realistic examples of what sex looks like, but they're not. They're there to entertain us or turn us on and we shouldn't compare our real life sex to them. We feel pressure to come as much or as easily as we think other people are, but we also worry about what types of orgasms we should be having. Types of orgasm. Whilst people can orgasm in different ways or from different body parts being stimulated, there's no such thing as right or better types of orgasm. People can come from all sorts of different things, from penetration, from clitoral stimulation, from having their nipples played with, from having their toes sucked, from being spanked, from giving your partner oral sex, from just thinking about sex. Because humans love putting things into categories, we like to sort these different kinds of stimulation into types of orgasm. But in doing that, we can fall into the trap of creating a hierarchy and a to-do list for ourselves. Clickbaity, or clitbaity, if you will, listicles about the seven types of orgasm that every woman should experience at least once can make us feel inferior if we haven't experienced them all, or if we come in one very specific way. We feel pressure to have multiple orgasms, to come from penetration, to come from nipple stimulation, to squirt when we come. Although as an aside, squirting is not the same thing as an orgasm, but that is for a whole other day in a whole other video. However you orgasm, there's no one or right way that it should happen. Maybe you can only orgasm when you're with a partner who you feel really comfortable and secure with, or maybe you can only come during casual sex because you feel like there's less pressure. It's also totally normal if you can't come without sex toys or if you can't come during partnered sex and can only get off on your own. Physical and mental factors come into play, like it can be harder to orgasm if you're distracted or stressed. And of course there's a bunch of other factors that can affect our relationship with our bodies, our pleasure and orgasms, like disability, chronic illness or female genital mutilation. Equally something that might work to get you off might not work every time. We're not machines and the way that we orgasm can change over time and even day to day. Everything from finding it really easy to orgasm, like just tensing and releasing your pelvic floor, to having really pleasurable sex but without orgasm is completely normal. Your orgasms might feel different depending on the type of stimulation that leads to it, or your orgasms might all feel the same, but they are all still orgasms. But even though there's no right way to orgasm or better types of orgasm, there's still a lot of pressure on us to improve and optimize our orgasms. Optimizing our orgasms. Today we are inundated with different sex toys, sexual wellness apps, articles and courses that proclaim to help us improve our orgasms and level up our sex lives. It's not surprising that all of this can turn to some kind of pleasure pressure that feeds into the idea that our orgasms aren't good enough. The apps and toys and courses that are available can definitely help people learn more and feel more comfortable in their bodies and have better sex. But their mere existence can also lead us to feeling like we're doing something wrong or that we need to be improving our orgasms and sex lives. In a highly capitalist society, there's also this idea that you can buy your way to good sex, which is something that the journalist Beth Ashley tackles in an article she wrote. She says, selling better sex will always rely on us having bad sex, so no business can ever truly be the sex positive savior it's packaged as in Instagram ads. Plus, a lot of products are marketed around sexual problems, like low libido, a lack of sex drive, or sex finishing quickly, which in actuality are not really problems at all. The issues these products promise to solve may be frustrating, but that doesn't mean they're not normal. Toys and other accessories aren't supposed to be a quick fix for bad sex. This feels like a really important part of this conversation. Are we being made to feel like our orgasms aren't good enough by companies who want to sell us things to fix us. Obviously lots of sex educators selling courses and companies in the sex tech and femtech spaces have good intentions and genuinely want to help people. But it's definitely interesting to think about who is telling us that these things are problems to begin with. It's also worth thinking about how a lot of these apps and toys and courses are marketed towards women and people of marginalized genders. Is all of this sexual development another form of emotional labor that's expected from us? All of this makes 
makes me think of a quote from Catherine Angel's book, Tomorrow Sex Will Be Good Again. She says that great sex doesn't always come naturally is a useful insight, but it is overwhelmingly women who are expected to spend time and resources on this kind of work. And this quote definitely applies to other people of marginalized genders, not just women. So what do we do with all of this pressure? Moving towards pleasure as the goal. When it comes to all of this pressure and expectations around what sex and orgasms should look like, we do what we often have to do when it comes to things about sex. We unlearn everything. I never said this was gonna be easy. This starts with little things. Talking to your partner about what you want your sex to look like, decentering orgasm and piv sex, or maybe even just forgetting about those things entirely for a while. Focusing on things that make you feel good, even if those things aren't necessarily what's going to lead to an orgasm, and exploring all of this in solo sex too. Some sex educators would describe this as queering sex, which means to approach sex through a perspective that rejects traditional categories of gender and sexuality, and breaks from cis-heteropatriarchal sexual scripts. I recently talked to sex writer Quinn Rhodes on my podcast all about this. He talked about how things like introducing more communication or spending more time working out what actually feels good or introducing more playfulness into sex can all count as queering sex. It's all about the idea that sex should look like whatever you and your partner want it to look like. You're definitely not alone if you felt pressure for your partnered or solo sex to look a certain way and if you find it difficult to talk about these things with your partner. We're taught that we're not supposed to talk about these things or question the scripts that we've been given, but those scripts don't work for everyone. Far more important than focusing on orgasms as a marker for good sex, we should move towards centering pleasure. Whatever you're doing, does it feel good when you're engaging in partnered or solo sex? Great, then that's what good sex looks like to you. Hopefully something to think about the next time you see an advice piece about how to have bigger and better orgasms. Thank you so much for joining me on this exploration of the pressure we might feel to always be improving our orgasms. I hope you enjoyed this video. I think it's really important that we have these conversations because no one should be made to feel like their orgasms aren't good enough. Orgasms aren't the be all and end all of sex and we need to normalize that. And a special thanks to my patrons who help support me making these kinds of videos. I hope that you're doing well and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.